Traveler Radio Show. Today is Tuesday. It's January 20th of 2015. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sharing your evening with us. We are so glad that you're here. I'm Aaron. Wait. Say it again. No, I'm Brad. Now he's Brad. I turned his mic up. <laughs> That's how you shut your husband up is turn his mic off. <laughs> anyway, just FYI. Okay. On a serious note, folks. We have got a very interesting show lined up for you tonight, and it's not a show just like a Barnum and Bailey circus. Sometimes, we, and most of the time, we do have very serious information that needs to get out to the people. And this is one of those shows that I think really needs to be discussed, bantered about, and passed on. I find that many of us do believe in the Bible, and we do believe that we are supposed to be preparing the funny thing is, is we can't prepare for everything. It's just not even physically possible to prepare for everything that we need to. However, I feel like if we're armed with knowledge, that's half the battle. Because if we have an inkling or an idea of what possibly could happen, we're less likely to curl up in a corner and pretty much die of fear we're much more likely to say, okay, I remember X show and X person talking about something like this was possible. And your brain can engage a little bit better if you're armed with a knowledge. And I believe there's a passage in the Bible, correct me if I'm wrong, that basically said my people die from lack of knowledge, perish from lack of knowledge, I'm sorry, perish. So this is one of those shows where I think we need to listen intently. This may be one of those shows you want to play back again to pick up more. The gentleman coming on tonight is very well researched. I have his documentation myself. Some of it will be posted up at the Truth Traveler as I figure out how to do that. Bear with me. He has his own YouTube channel, and he came into this as a disbeliever in what we're going to talk about tonight, so that almost gives him more validity with me. We've had so much different information out there circulating on the Internet about Planet X. Most of them just go over the top, and, and it, it, they're not even backing anything up. They really can't source anything. This gentleman is going to source it for you. He's also going to tie it into the Bible, past, present, and future. That's what drew me to him. His name is Gil Broussard, and he's an amateur astronomer. He's a researcher. His web, his web, his YouTube channel is Planet, the number seven, and then X, Planet 7X. And you'll find out why it's called that here in a minute. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show tonight, Gil. Well, thank you, Aaron. Uh, it's a pleasure. Pleasure joining you today. I'm glad you're here. Well, you too. And I am going to get some of those things like we talked about up at the Truth Traveler. I think I can do it. we just got to play with it, Gil. Uh, is okay. This information, I think, needs to be passed. And I've, I've listened to your show with Augusto Perez twice. Okay. Um, okay. I listened to another interview you did with two gentlemen that they have divided up into like a five-part series, six-part series, something like that. I've listened yeah. to that as well. And I, I still can't absorb it all, Gil. Yeah, well, it, um, Maybe this, I'm just... is a, well, this is a subject that, that's uh, very difficult. You can't do it on just a, a, uh, a casual basis. You have to really be interested or be concerned, let's say, and... Uh, really look at the data deeply, and uh, I can touch on it on just a, maybe a two-hour show, but it would take probably more like five to six hours to get everything I think so. processed properly. But, uh, oh, I think so, too. <clears throat> well, why don't we call this part one? Mm -hmm. Part one? We may have to. <laughs> All right. Okay, Gil, explain, explain to the listeners about the phone call from your friend asking you about Planet X, and let's go from there. I'm just going to turn the mic over to you, and unless I'm not understanding something or I have a question, I'm not going to interrupt you because I think you need to talk. Well, please please ask questions any, at, at, at any time. Uh, but, yes, this uh, whole uh, research started from a phone call when a friend of mine called me, and uh, he asked me if Planet X was real and if it was biblical, and my first his, re, uh, his response to that was that that it was not real, and that I was pretty sure I could prove it biblically that it didn't. There was parts in it that would state that it wouldn't it wouldn't exist. 
So after the conversation, I said, well, um, I'll probably will get more of these in the future. Let me back that up with information because I'm making a claim on what I think, not what I know. So um, that started the search. And uh, uh, when I read quite a bit of the stuff that's on the Internet, uh, just like you had said at the, at the entrance of your show, that they're not backing it up with evidence. Uh, they're pretty much reading uh, what it turned out to be. They're reading eyewitness accounts, but no evidence for us to confirm its orbit, its length of travel, its size, uh, many of these other items. Where's the data that we can look at with our own eyes and make our own decision? And what I'll put forth on your show tonight is more the evidence side. And I know some people out there are not really interested in evidence, but this is the first obstacle we have to get past. Is it real or is it not? Okay. Exactly. And, and so... Wait, let me interject here. Let me interject here, Gil. There is so much disinformation out there on the Internet. When I first started researching Planet X... You're almost bombarded with everything, and you're just like, you know, you finally say, okay, you know what? I'm I'm not an astronomer at all. I don't know anything. I, I can find the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, okay? That's about it, okay? Well, I can see the moon. I can see Venus, okay? I just gave up. Okay. Sure. Well, um, the information I'm going to give you tonight uh, will narrow that field of view. Uh, awesome. Considerably. You see, there's 88 constellations. 88. And I'm going to show uh, or talk about five documented scientific reports and one actual uh, missing encounter with it uh, that NASA had. And out of the 88 constellations, all of these independent studies not looking at each other's data, independent, or pointing to the same constellation. And that constellation is Sagittarius, and not just anywhere in Sagittarius, but on the ecliptic. So the search field is extremely narrow now to look. All right? Okay. And uh, what got us started with this was a finding at the... Uh, the white paper report uh, for the ones out there in the audience, that's a scientific report uh, of uh, the supernova of 1054. It's a re-evaluation. That, that report was not, was pointing out that people assumed that it was a supernova when it actually it was not. When they went back and reread the text, this object is seen in multiple constellations and a supernova does not move. Therefore, it cannot be in multiple constellations. It was viewed for 26 months, and the Chinese, the Koreans, and the Japanese are so accurate with their uh, uh, documentation. Uh, this is exactly what we were looking for, to better plot a segment of its course to better predict its path. And... The Asian astronomers gave us uh, the year, the month, the time of day, the place of origin in what city or in a country, the level of brightness, where in the in, in uh, what constellation it was, was it by any known stars, what angle and distance mm -hmm. from the stars it was, and and with that kind of information you can plot it. You know, if you have multiple sightings which they gave us. So right. when I found that report and they didn't know what it was, they listed it as a, a, uh, that it was not a supernova and they didn't really move on with the research. You're just making a statement that they don't know what it is, but it's not a supernova. Well, I looked at it and said, well, I think I can plot this. Let me, let me make an attempt. And I needed to have a first try because I don't have the level of uh, computers that NASA would have or anyone else. 
So I had to take a, an estimate. So since I was already on the assumption that CO6 and 7 in Revelation is talking about a meteorite shower, and it says that they will wish death for five months, that's a span of 150 days, that's equal to the time of Noah, between the first event, and I call it the second event, where the water started to recede, and by the time the water's going to rain, and the time was 150 days, that's the same amount of okay. time, time period. So I said, well, let's see if we'll put this down, and then I needed to know an entry and exit point. Well, I chose the exit point uh, to be somewhere around mid Passover. And I, from that point, I stretched it to where it went to the end of August. That's 150 days. And it went around the sun on a planetary plane of Earth. Very few objects on a planetary plane of Earth to start out with. But I have to start somewhere. And for it to have a meteorite shower, it has to be on a planetary plane, at least one leg. But this is talking about two meteorite showers. So you have both legs crossing Earth's planetary plane twice with a fixed point around the sun. So that's three fixed points. That's locked in. So the odds of this object matching that data is greater than winning the lottery 10 times in a row. So I made the first attempt. I placed it. I took the software. I built a model, placed it in, in, in the software, put my position in Beijing as well as China, uh, uh, Japan and uh, Korea from the viewpoint of the astronomers of the time period with the exact year and date. Let the model move the object according to Kepler's laws of planetary motion. As it gets closer to the sun, it moves quicker. Okay, hold that and thought right there. Go ahead. Uh, uh, hold that thought. Yeah, we're, uh, Kepler, we're going to go to break, and we'll be back up with a short segment. We'll be right back to Gil Broussard. This guy has seen Planet 7X. Right before the break, Kelly, you talked about the Kepler theory about how it speeds up the closer to the sun that it gets. Yes, uh, Kepler's laws of uh, of motion, which the Chinese or any ancient observer uh, would not have known how to fake the movement of a planet because they didn't have the formula to better do this to where it matches a uh, a uh, model. In other words, Kepler, uh, he, he, he published his laws in 1609. And uh, so we're talking about when the Chinese saw this, was, this was in 1054 AD, less than 900 years ago. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why when you read so-called the 3600-year theory, uh, that that doesn't work work out as far as the evidence that I've accumulated. Uh, it didn't even work out for many people bring up uh, Dr. Harrington, Robert Harrington. He did not agree with uh, uh, Stitchin's model. He agreed that there's a, another planet out there, but he did not agree with a 3600-year orbit. He had a much shorter okay. orbit and a much smaller planet. If it had a 36-year uh, hundred orbit, that would be a monster of a planet, okay? And, uh, and in fact, uh, Heron, uh, Dr. Harrington put out a white paper report stating all of his calculations and uh, what he thought it was, the size and the position. So, but when we get back and we take a look at the model uh, uh, that we place in the software, and viewed mm -hmm. from the position of these ancient astronomers, what it turns out is that we get an exact match. And that was shocking. For any astronomer listening would, would, would know this. When we have an object that's on the planetary plane of Earth and is bigger than us, we have a problem. Yes. Okay? So, um, 